All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, today we have in front of you a nice Triumph snorkel filler. And I know it's probably a couple of videos ago now, but when I flashed a couple to kind of tease these, I think I had a different one or two out. But um, just for sake of color, rather than seeing, you know, just plain old black ones like this, um, I thought this nice kind of metallic cap gold band red body, I think this would be a little bit more of a fun one just to see on camera. So I swapped a few things out. And I also noticed that there was a bit of a difference between the ones I was anticipating and this one. And this one does need to be repaired because the snorkel filler is upside down. The slant is towards the top rather than facing down. So this one seems like maybe has been repaired in the past or messed around with in the past. So the other one that I think I pulled out, let me see if I can find it amongst my... Yeah, here's one of the other ones that I think this is like an Australian one or maybe somewhere else or maybe just a different type. Um, but it has a flat snorkel. Um, and I think it'd be easier. Like this one, once you understand how to place in the correct or not correct, but the more traditional kind of slanted tapered um, snorkel, these are going to be pretty straightforward. So I figured let's do the hard one. And this one will just make sense and it's it's much more straightforward so again all the little reasons why i finally opted um, for this particular one so let's take a quick look at it overall and just kind of get an assessment and kind of see some of the beat up parts right so this guy has a nice um metal cap a little bit of dust there and it's got these nice grooved striations, a little bit of texture on the cap um, that you hopefully you can see. Run my fingernail across it, so you can hear a little bit. Um, it has a nice shaper clip, should be springy. Yes, indeed. It has the white dot at the top, and it's got a little bit of a gold band, which right above that band, let's see if I can read it over the camera, shapers made in usa so straightforward and then we can take off the cap see the barrel and this one has seen some wear it definitely has the scuffs and um just kind of usual wear that you'll see from something rolling around in a desk or somebody's pocket or something uh but despite all that it looks like we have mm -hmm. try and zoom a nice decently crisp um imprint the wa shaver pen company Fort Medicine, Iowa, USA, made in USA. So everything there is really nice. And I'm going to come down here. We have the turning knob, which has its nice striations. I'm going to peek over the camera. And I don't really see any real gouges or teeth marks. Maybe a couple little blemishes here or there. But overall, this looks in good condition. You'll see a lot of like little bite marks or scratches in this area. Sometimes these things have gotten tight. Um, over years, if this particular plastic kind of shrinks and squeezes, it gets really hard to unturn or to turn sometimes. So I think people have resorted to using their teeth or some other thing to grip it. So be on the lookout for that. And of course, down here, just like with the touchdowns, a um, little breather hole, take a look and see that there are no cracks down here. And that's uh, also what I saw. Let me see if I can find it quickly. This is one of the other ones I had flashed to you before, just red top, red body. But as I got a closer look at it, let me see if I can kind of show what I found. Um, there it is. See that little, try to fight the reflections. But right there, there's a bit of a crack. If I put a little pressure, it spreads a little bit. But right there is a crack. And I'm going to see if I can fix that at some point. But I thought, let's not mess with this one just yet. Another, Again, another reason I opted for this one. But this one would have been a beauty. Because, quite frankly, I love those open nibs for some reason. Nothing against the Triumph nibs, but I love a good open nib. And it just looks so nice. But anyway... So, yeah, so this one looks nicely intact. I don't see any cracks there. And we go up here, we have 
the um, the I'll call it the cap ring. Uh, there's probably a better term. Um, that's what's going to catch the cap and that, and and let it screw on, and that is nicely firmly in place. We have our textured section, and in this particular one, I don't see any gouges. Looks all nice and clean. And then we go right up here to our nice Triumph conical nib. And this one is a two-toned. And if we dare focus, let's see if we can get something in there to say what it says. So again, it looks like Schaefer's 14K. If you can't read that, I apologize. Made in USA. Yeah, that's coming through pretty good. Let's take a look at the feed. And sometimes you'll have some broken little fins of the feed in there. Not not a deal breaker, but just something to make note of because you will be grasping this section as you try to take it out. So just be aware of this. And these things do become brittle over time. And of course, we have this. Oops, I went the wrong way. We have the snorkel. And this one, I'm really just kind of looking to see if there's any bends, any breaks. I've had somewhere, oddly enough, the tip has been split, like it just splays open, it's weird. And then we have the slanted opening, and I'm not sure if it's going to show up. There is indeed a little feed or a little plasticky thing that goes through the barrel. Um, so there should be something in there, so do not mistake that for some clotted up ink or something dried in there. There is actually a little plastic channel in there in, in these, so don't just go trying to dig that out. You know, flush it, flush it, flush it, make sure it um, opens up and, and flows well, but don't dig those out. Okay, so let's close this back up. I'm gonna zoom back out. And I guess the first thing is, let's go ahead and start taking this apart. And much like the other one, these are actually later, you, you know, later May, like 50s, I want to say 60s, um, just off the top of my head. Oh, yeah, look, I almost forgot. There is a little imprint on the bottom. It says an M5, so maybe this will be like a medium nib. We'll find out when it writes, and I'll see if I can dig into some nib no nomenclature on these things, so find out what that means. So this is actually made to be very easily taken apart, I think. Um, and you have nib units, but we're now into the era of, oh, thank God, the nib unit just comes off nice and clean like that. And that should be a little gasket that makes a nice tight seal along the snorkel. So I'm gonna dig out one of my tools and I'll just use this one. I don't think I've shown this on camera before. So this is a little something I got, again, probably from pen tooling, but it's just a little scooper tool. It was meant for some of the Parker Vacuumatics to get the the balls out of the cups, which I owe you another video on that to actually show you um, how to do that. And you just pull that out. So that is a gasket. Kind of sits right up in there. And I've messed around with these a little bit, but there are little notches in there. Um, that you can use to s turn, screw and unscrew the inner feed from this kind of larger section. I'm not sure what I'm going to call it, but you can do a little bit of adjustments with this. And again, um, maybe not again, but this Triumph nib has some threads on it. So typically this overall plastic body has some threads at the top and that is what the conical nib screws onto and it's adhered to and then the feed is within that so you can imagine that if you were putting on the nib to this larger plastic section you slide in the feed and you need to make a few adjustments there are some I don't say like basically flathead kind of um, slot in there so that you can make some fine adjustments and get everything lined up or at least that's what I've been led to understand, so that's going to be my explanation until, you know, please somebody in the comments correct me when I'm wrong. Happy to entertain some, some useful information. So there's the unit. I'll set it aside. I'm going to keep it as a unit. I don't want to take it apart. I'm going to soak it. I'm going to flush it. And if it's good, I'm not going to mess with that. And ooh, this gasket 
I just dropped it into my full little drawer here. So if I don't see it a second, I'm not going to worry about it. But I was just going to see how flexible it was. But I think regardless, I'm going to replace it and show you what a new one looks like. So not worth chasing it down. And so let's see. The next thing I can do is we can undo this. And just like the touchdown, this will get the section removed, right? And again, just some big space to kind of be able to slip over that. It is kind of notched in there so that you'll only be able to put the snorkel section in certain ways because there are little bends and folds that match up with some of these channels on the side. So they will only fit in certain ways, but that'll come in handy later. We have a little ring, a little decorative ring. We have, maybe this guy will come off, maybe not. If not, I'm just not, I'm not gonna mess with it too much. But this is the cap ring with the threads, and that should be it. Aside from that gasket, there should be nothing else in here. The gasket can either show up, you know, up here like it was. Sometimes I've seen it down in this chamber, so be on the lookout for it. And we got it, so these two are done. Let me zoom back out a touch. And where is my arrow? So just like the touchdown, the simple th way to do this, and I can do this off camera, I'm not going to show you necessarily show again, but you can take your screwdriver, come down to the bottom of here, you can apply some heat, and screw out the little screw that holds this in place, and that comes straight out, but let's set that aside, because I think we covered that. And this is going to be the hard part. I think this is going to be the hardest part of the whole thing. So in here you have the sack that holds the ink um, that's going to be compressed by your vacuum and released creating the vacuum that brings in the ink. And here you have this little rubber piece that is crimped in to the end and sitting and glued within that is the snorkel. So this is going to be your hardest part, like how do I wiggle this out, how do I get it out? And this is going to be a limitation right now and I do apologize being able to zoom in and show certain things. So let me get something to point. And I'm going to grab, just for sake that it has a sharp end on it, maybe my little dental pick. Maybe I can sh point with that. But as I said earlier, here are the larger crimps that kind of go into the channels that kind of keep this thing stable and allow it to be twisted and pushed out smoothly and in a single plane. Um, if you go in between, there are these spaces here, right in here, that if you put a little bit uh, like a fine tool, sometimes I use this, sometimes I just use a little sewing needle to kind of get in here just enough to kind of open up the metal. Again, open up the metal, and I'm not going to do it fully here because I need to get closer to my work rather than over the camera. but. If you do a little bit of these things, and actually maybe I kind of did. Let's see if I can just give it a little bit of a space. And I'm just doing a little bit so that when I come back and put this back in, I'm not re-crimping a lot of metal. I'm just making enough of a bend to kind of reduce some friction and let the hole be a little bit less tight. So just a touch. And I may... If I'm not su successful now, I'll do this off camera and I'll kind of show you the end result. So, let's see, I've gone around once and let me just see what, it, what it's winding up doing. And the key is, um, do a little bit of wiggle. Sometimes you can use some heat around here. And another thing that I've done, and I would have to go digging for it, but I have a little metal piece, more, it's more or less just a thick wire, that sometimes I've snaked up through here and let it abut to the back of this and just kind of use that to press it out. Um, actually, I wonder, maybe I'll try that real quick, hang on. Let me see if I have a 
I'm just kind of curious if one of my metal dowels will slip up through there. I haven't really thought about it, but let me just kind of see. Mm, I'm looking at it. Maybe it looks a little bit, little bit too, too big, but let's see. I doubt it. Because this sack is, nope, that's a little bit too big. But let's see. Do a little bit of wiggling. Not so much. Yeah, I mean, I barely made an imprint on these. So let me give it one more go. And then rather than keep you on, I'll do it off camera. Just ever so slight of a bend, just to kind of get the crimp loosened. Let's see. Let's just go ahead and see where we are with this. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Nah, I'm not going to pull too hard because you can actually, I mean, there's only a little bit of adhesive, so you can pull this tube right out, um, which I've done, and which is why I discovered that I can snake something up through here and kind of use a little brute force just to kind of knock it out. Um, so do be careful, and it's not the end of the day if you wind up pulling this snorkel tube out, but rather than belabor the point, I'm going to go ahead and go off camera and do that so I don't have to bore you. And it might be worth doing. Sorry for all the noise. What did I do with it? Is that my wire? Oh, maybe there it is. Okay. Okay, let's see. Maybe I will show you. Why not? So I just have this thicker gauge wire. I want to say it's like aluminum or something. I used it for some forming with some clay work, just a little artsy stuff. But I'm going to take it, and I'll just kind of show you the idea. Now this sack is actually a little bit soft still. So I get it up in here, and I kind of make sure it's off to the side. And what I've really done at certain times is I get a little bit of a surface down here, and I just do a little bit of knocking. And you can see, maybe, that there's ever so slight of a lip that just started to come out a little bit. But I can play around with the crimping, and that's what I kind of do sometimes just to knock it out as a minute. So, glad I found it. Glad, glad you got to see it. And I will spend two seconds looking for my screwdriver. I really thought it was right where I left it, but apparently it wasn't. But maybe not. So, again, also, the last thing I'm going to remind you of, once you get this off, get this um, metal barrel out, there is that little rubber ring, just like in the touchdown, the little gasket that I tend to take just a simple, plain sewing needle. You can put yourself a little um, pencil eraser on the tip of it to protect your finger, but you just go in there, and just kind of pick it apart from the side, ream it out, and I think I actually show a good job of it on the last, on the touchdown video, so don't forget about that, and I think we'll leave it here, so at the next part, what I, what I would do in the meantime would be to do my taping for this, and looks, I don't have much to polish, actually, because I'm not going to polish the top with anything abrasive other than the metal polish. So, really, all I'm going to do is the barrel. And I'm not going to go over this with any of my micro-mesh pads, so I'll really just tape this off and just polish the barrel. And then I'll come back again with my plastic polishes, and I'll use a little bit different one this time. I'll actually use, introduce some Novo plastic polish that I use rather than just Simichrome. Um, so some new polishes, polishes, you'll see how it comes off, and then we'll come back and we'll kind of put everything back together. We'll put the new gasket in. We shall um, re-sack within here. 
we will reinsert within here and make sure everything's crimped down and then we'll put it all back together so complicated mechanism in a way but overall pretty simple but I'll go ahead and sign off we'll get a few things done and we'll come back when we're gonna put some stuff back together okay so hold tight we'll see you soon so here we are it's now the next day I like I promised I went ahead and polished up my barrel and all I've done so far is just use the micro mesh and I soaked everything cleaned everything and I have everything laid out ready to be reassembled and I do want to point out one thing that I forgot to show on the last time hidden in the barrel and I forgot to pull this out hidden in the barrel was this spring and all I had to do was stick a little something in back and push it out the front so this is the spring that wants to push the snorkel mechanism out of the barrel so basically sits over there and maybe this will be a good good way to break it down so if you can imagine this in the barrel you've got your sack protector within your sack sack within the sack protector you've got the spring sliding along the edge of that barrel and in between the spring and the sack protector is your typical plunger and what the plunger this plunger does is not only does it does the touchdown filling but when you lock it down imagine that it's going to thread this in and be able to screw on and pull back so if this is a pushed forward snorkel if I get this here and twist it's going to want to pull back into the barrel so that's what the threading mechanism does so this if we slide the spring on and let's go ahead and maybe just fake it for a second so if we push this in without anything else going on this wants to be pushed forward this wants to be always in the extended position because a spring is keeping that out and you'd really have to push against it which is why you have the spiral thread so for me to pull it back because it wants to stay out I have to engage it and pull it and of course I mean everything else the section and the nib and everything will be on and that's what's keeping this kind of like butting up against that with the, with the snorkel out so, so if I twist this section which maybe I should do it one more time when everything's together is what's going to grab the threads pull it back and create tension on that spring so the threads hold it back the spring wants to push it forward so that while your knob is fully down and secured to the barrel you've got this in and so as you unscrew it that way you're going to unscrew and it's slowly going to work its way down the threads and the spring is going to push it out and so now it is out and engaged the spring keeps it out and you can do your plunging but let's see if i can get that together a little bit more and maybe we can see it together as a, a whole entity so first thing I've got to do I mean I could do any number of things kind of first but I'm going to take the barrel and I'm gonna go ahead and put my o-ring in so I have a new o-ring right here and with that I'm gonna get out my silicone grease and I can't honestly not remember I don't think it was too difficult last time when I put this on but just for sake of showing it again and making sure I had a good take I'm going to show you again my little wooden dowel with a certain amount of duct tape on the end to kind of give me something to stop up against and I'm going to shoot for that little um, indentation with the two rings that's where the um, gasket's going to sit so right in between that little area so I'm going to just go ahead and stick him down in there and maybe reach around the camera a different way. Sorry if I bump it. 
and let's see how good we get at working around the camera. So I've got this placed right around where I don't want it to go any further down. And I'm just going to start working it in. You can use a little wooden thing like this. You can use a toothpick, anything that kind of lets you be a little fidgety and get down into the barrel and kind of give you some direct access. And I am actually finding it hard to do this with an awkward craning of my neck around the camera. So let me give it a college try. Let's see if we can do it together. If not, I may just have to pop her up, pop out and do it myself. And just rely on the magic. Yeah, let me try this one more time just out by myself, okay? If it takes too long, I'll pause, but maybe I can do this fairly quickly and keep it all realistic, I think. Almost. I'm working it around. Got most of it in there. Once it just kind of naturally wants to seat itself. So once you get part of it, it tends to want to ring itself around. And just almost take care of itself. Says me as I chase the little loop around. Okay, give me another little try, and I'm not going to keep you on for too long. I think the last time too, once I pulled it off, it didn't take me very long, so I almost had regretted taking it off the camera just because it was so in there right away. But then again, when I feel confident about it, just like with the vacuumatic the other day, or well, other week now, um, never went to plan. Yeah, it's a little finicky today, so I'm going to go ahead and pause, and we'll come right back, and we'll finish the putting together. And as always the case, once I go off screen, it popped right in. So sorry about the prolonged effort in front of you, but the, the method's the same, and maybe one day I'll be able to repair one in front of you. But now that we have the gasket in place, maybe you can see it, maybe not. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a couple things. I guess it really doesn't matter which way I do it first, but I'm going to go ahead and slip the spring in. Oh, wrong end. Slip the spring in. It'll seat itself down there. I'm going to go ahead and get my grease back. And I'm going to put a little bit around the tip here. Let that be my lead point, and let that gasket kind of further spread it down so I'm not handling something super sticky. It's sticking to my fingers right now. And make sure I put it in the right end this time. Put it down there. I'm going to take a little dowel thing just to boom, push it through the gasket. That, oop, I pull my spring right back out. Put that back in. Easy peasy few plunges nice and smooth. Grab my little flat top screwdriver. We have a nice now polished up screw and I will see if I can just drop it down. Give it a little bit of a shake. Sometimes it comes right through. Other times not so much because it took a tumble. And actually, let me just hold this out because I'm going to keep moving it up. So I can just, let's see if I can do it this way. Put the screw on. 
get it going on the inside. There it goes, popped right out. I'm gonna take my little knob. And what I usually want to do, if I can get it open, There we go. I'll just put a little dot of shellac just on the tip, just as a small way of holding it, just so not too much, just to flavor, just to see if that will hold it in a little bit longer. So I've got my screwdriver in and tighten it down. Nothing too tight. There it goes. Smooth. And you can hear the vacuum already starting. So, good seal. Um, I will go ahead and throw this in there now. Spring goes in. I can help it along a little bit down. And let's go ahead and talk about our sack. So this is about a size 15, pretty consistently among different models. So I have here a size 15 sack. Give it a good stretch, because sometimes it can be a little bit tight to get in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and give it a good pre-stretch. And I have my talc, my little bag of talc. and talked up. Didn't go all the way down. Yes, it did. Because you can see some sack right here at the bottom. So it came all the way down to the bottom. Okay. Got to ensure. Yep, yep, yep. So I'm going to grab that there. And this time, instead of a big section, um, you're going to be eliminating the space from the top to the bottom. So your nipple is essentially this lower section right here. Do I have it in a good layer? That small, that is your nipple for this. So you're gonna subtract out about that much. I'm going to go ahead and take my scissors. Where have they gone? Here they are. Squeeze it down straight. Take my scissors. And let me look over the camera. Give myself a good straight cut. Kind of twisted that one. That was my fault. In the end, turned out nicely. So put that to the side. And so just like with everything else, you're gonna wind up slipping the nipple into the sack, letting that get tacky, and slipping it in. So let me go ahead and do that. And let me show you, see if I can zoom in. But I think I remember telling you early on that in in the snorkel is a plastic kind of feed situation to kind of um, let the ink travel. And here, sticking out the back, is that little bit of plastic feed. So that's that staking itself all the way through the barrel. So don't look in here, see something dark, say, oh, is that ink? Let me just really try to get that out. No, 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 that is meant to be there. And I have soaked this and I flushed it, so I know this flows nice easily so I know it's an open channel and the feed is not blocked okay zoom back out I'm gonna take my shellac again I'm gonna look over the camera apologize if it floats off a little bit and put you right there <laughs> do a little bit more I want this to it's not as 
big as a usual sack nipple, so I kind of want to put a decent amount of shellac to make sure it's going to take hold. And this is very small, so I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to sl slip it on because I know it fit nice and easily. Just do it by hand. Give it a little twirl. Make sure that's spread. And that is the sack replaced, right? So I'm going to let that be for just a second. And we're going to come up to the top and put the section together so that'll get tacky. I can mess with it a little bit. So here is um, the nib. The nib came out nice, very nice, very shiny. And there's a couple things I can do here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grease is going to be a friend on this pen. I'm going to take a little bit of grease put it around this gasket. I'm going to go ahead and put it in. This is the right side up. So nib here, back to the barrel here. So I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of grease. I'm going to put it right in here and let that be a placeholder for now. I'm going to take my little dowel. Is this small enough? Maybe not. Let me take a different dowel. Just one of my little metal dowels. All I'm really going to do is push this down so that it's actually going to lay flat in here. And I might have to take it back out, play with it, just to kind of get it to do what I want. Because it wants to go to its edge. And that's not what I want. Ah, okay, it kind of did it, then I messed it up. Yeah, we'll let that lay in there. More or less. And you can do this a couple different ways. I just did it now just to have something to do while we let this kind of get a little bit tacky and dry. So let's kind of see what we can do now. And I'm going to retalc this sucker. Do some of talc on it. Okay. I'm going to grab it. I'm going to give it a little bit. Oh. Don't let me do that. A little bit of a pull. Just something I do to help me get it in to the sack protector. And there we go. So here's where you're going to have to remember. So on this, you'll see that as I knocked it out, maybe, let's see, there are little lumps right there, right there right there and right there and they co correspond to these those guides right so that's what you're going to be looking for to line it back up hopefully i'm not hiding your view i've got it lined up and that's when i'm just going to start to wiggle it down into place Okay, so it's got a seat, and I'm going to do one thing to kind of double check. I'm going to show you what I tend to do. So, eh. Oh, well, we'll just redo that. Got a little bit ahead of myself that I could just do it, but if we slide this over, you're going to see that in here, do you see the four channels that correspond to the four flaps on here? I hope you do. I'm going to slide that in, and it will only go in here, maybe have a certain ways, right? So that's the only way it can go in. And the other thing will be, you slip your nib on, and it's going to screw down. So this is the part where you have to play around a little. You have to figure out where I'm going to insert, because if I were to insert it, in, the, in this particular orientation, I'm going to come to a point where, hey, that's off to the side. So I'm probably going to have to take this out and know that I'm going to turn it and take it that way. So it's just a matter of knowing 
where to, where to place it, where to orient it to get your feed the way you want. So that's just me stepping ahead a little bit, showing a little bit extra. Okay, so I've got that started. So I'm going to do this zoom back out because it takes a little bit of pressure. So I'm going to go ahead and take my knockout block, put this into one of the smaller holes, very small, and this is where I'm just going to start to start a little downward force and do my wiggle wiggle. There we go. You see it slipped right on and now it's flush in there. And you can hopefully see maybe there is a sack right up until just about the very tip of it so decent cut. That's going to be hard to see on camera I know but you can see the sack down in there. Okay. And so this is when you could take a little bit of pliers and everywhere that we had kind of shoved our little spacer to try to pry that away, you can take either your fingers or a little bit of pliers very gently and just squeeze it back down. And I use back to my section just to see how it fits that came out just a wee little bit that looks pretty good let me press it down just a little bit make sure that stays in okay okay that's good okay just to see if there's anything that's going to catch and yeah this feels like there's going to be a little bit that's open it's not as exactly smooth as it was, so what I'll do now is I'll go grab my pliers and I'll start doing little bits of crimping very gently so I get to the point where I don't get that resistance. Okay, so I'm going to take a pause, fiddle with this, get it the way I want it, and we'll come back and finish up. Okay, I'm back again. Let me show you the pliers I used. This is just a pair of little needle, needle nose pliers and I had put some electrical tape on the tips just to make them softer and just for sake of it all I really did was take it and orient it so that I'm squeezing in between those little raised areas just a little bit of a squeeze and I worked it around a few times just to kind of get to it and I would check myself with this and if you remember it had a little bit of a rub and it took me some pressure but now it's rubbing because it's just touching it, of course, but super easy, super smooth. And I can rotate it, get them down in different tracks, very smooth. So that was the goal, and that's why when you start to get it off, get the uh, snorkel out, you do as little as you can. That's why I kind of resort to a little bit of a pounding method because I don't want to bend too, bend too much crack it, bend it too much out of shape that I can't get it back to running smooth. So that was why I do it that in, in that particular way. All right, let me get my bearings. Where am I now? So let's see. I think everything's here and I'm going to grease is going to be my friend. So I'm going to go ahead and grease up in here a little bit. Let that run smoothly. And I think we're ready. I can put this in here. This goes on any which, oh, almost. Let's do this. Let's put on this little ring. And there we go. I can put him in here. And now we're going to play around a bit and put our section on. And slide, screw it in. Okay. So, there. Yeah, so if I show what I did earlier, this wants to be out, that spring wants to keep it out. So if I push this in, it's going, this this barrel, this plunger unit is going to engage that threaded area of the sack protector, grab it, and pull it back against the pressure of that spring. And so that is now within 
mm, the nib unit. So if I were to undo it again, hold it, that spring is going to want to put it back into the out, out position. So there we go. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to see if we need to change it. And look at that. First try, I happen to choose the right orientation within the section to get it beveled down so that when I tighten it down, my bevel is there. So that's wonderful. But I'm not done yet because you're going to say, wait, what about that gasket that you put in but that fell back out? So this is what I'm going to do about that. So I'm going to take the gasket, put a little lubrication on it, even do a little bit along here. I'm going to slip it over, push it down. Yeah, this is a smarter way to do it anyway. I thought I could be fancy and do it earlier, but it didn't work. Slide this in, and that will push it down, and I have now my complete snorkel filler. But there we go. And the last thing I was going to do, because I did everything of the polishing up until um, my liquid polishes, I want to introduce a couple ones. So I use these for more of the plastic ones, sometimes I use them on the celluloid, but these are specifically um, some Novus um, plastic polishes. So you go from a, a 3, which is a heavy scratch remover, kind of gets the more obvious wear. Then you step down to number two, the fine scratch remover. And I don't have it here because number one is just a spray. I think it's just an anti-static spray. And then I'll just kind of spray at the end and just wipe it down. And it kind of acts like the Renaissance wax, I think, in a sense. So let me grab a little soft towel. And we'll take a look and see what it does. Let me wipe off just some of the greasiness because I've been handling that silicone a little bit. So let me go ahead and do that. And we'll take number three. And let's see, I'll just put a little bit on my finger. This one is the white one. And one good thing about plastic is when you use the micro uh, mesh on it, they do tend to really respond well. I think it's easier to do some of these molded plastics than it is to, to polish the celluloids. Um, but, you know, maybe that's just, I'm kidding myself, but I'm just going to take the coarse one and work it all around, pay a little bit more attention to the knob because I didn't do any polishing to the knob because I, I didn't want to take off the finger grips. So I'm going to work it, get to the point where everything's disappeared. And just for kicks, I'm going to go ahead and run it around the section a little bit. Yeah, in this case, just because it's easier, I figured I would do it with the pen all put together. You know, but I could have done this as well, just by itself and all taken apart. So that's step one, or step three, I guess, however you want to count it down. And for number two, Nicely is also a different, yeah, a different color. It's more of a maybe. Ooh, I hope this shows up. There's more of a a yellowy tan color, not quite as white. So if you happen to put them on your put them on something just so you can dip into them, the white, the th number three, the coarse is white. The number two, the fine, is a slightly off off white yellowish color. And that was a ton. So let's go ahead and do this one. Let's just spread it all around. I'm not worried about the imprint. This is so minor, it's not going to do anything really to that imprint. And luckily this one has a nice imprint in it, so it's got imprint to spare. Mm -hmm. A little 
bit here on this section. There we go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to get a different soft claw. My nice gray one. And I'll just kind of wipe off any extra and get it down to the final. And there it is. Let me see if I can zoom in. And maybe we can evaluate the surface a little bit. So I actually think I did a decent job with the micro mesh. But this one really, I think it does give a little bit of shine to plastics. And so I kind of like it for these um, Parker 51s, these Schaefer's, these touchdowns, vacuumatics, anything, whether you've got this injection molded plastic, I think it tends to work pretty well. So there she goes, and that is a nice red. That is very red. And the cap earlier, I went ahead and did with some Simichrome. It's got some wear and tear, so it's still got some signs of use. Couldn't get everything out. And sadly, am I gonna find it? But maybe it'll be hard to see on camera. But right around in here, there's a little bit of plate breakdown where it kind of got a little bit tarnished and I couldn't get it out, so. It'll be hard to see on camera, I'm sure, but it's there. My eye knows where to see it. But otherwise, dent-free cap, very nice lines, a little bit of silver and gold to complement this nice red. So I'm going to go ahead and clean up. I'll do my little bit of research. I'll get my things ready, and we'll test out the pen. We'll see how it writes, and we'll talk about it. All right, see you in a few. All right, welcome back. I did, did a little bit of a final polish on it. I went back with my um, Renaissance wax for both the barrel and the cap, and I then applied the Novus number, number one, that spray I had mentioned, just to see you know, what it added. And I think it's more of an anti-static maybe uh, kind of a thing. But overall, I think the pen turned out wonderfully. I mean, it's the stainless steel cap with some gold filled trim, nice smooth clip. And while the stainless steel, you know, it shows a little bit of wear, like it's got, you know, little fine marks that unless I took something and really like, polished and buffed the cap, those are going to be there. But um, overall, I think it's great. There are no dents. The sleek kind of four line repeating design is very crisp. Um, the cap band, which is gold filled, um, where I thought I had a little bit of tarnish that I wasn't going to be able to get off. I think when I went back over it, it actually came off. So maybe I just had missed it and didn't get put enough elbow grease the first time. But overall, the tarnish I thought I had, not there. And the barrel, I, like I said, I love these um, injection plastics because they do take polishing and the micro mesh really well. So I think this guy is darn near pristine, I would say. Um, I'd have a hard time seeing any kind of defects um, myself. And the grip lines for the section, not the section, but the uh, turning knob, super crisp, no teeth marks. And then of course we have our two-tone nib with our spiraled section um, for gripping and everything looks fantastic. I couldn't have asked for a better pen. And we have a nice Easily, easy in, easy out. Um, breather tube, stainless steel, nice tip still. We can see our plastic feed throughout. And just because I love doing this, I'm gonna open it up and see if we can hear. Yeah, I hope, I hope that captured, but it's just so satisfying to get that little hiss of air knowing that you've made an airtight seal. You're gonna get a good fill. Um, and I just wanted to share that with you. So to match the pen, I've never used this particular brand of ink, but I've heard good things about it, and I just happen to have a few bottles from a set that I bought. So this is J. Urban. It's a rouge to kind of match the burgundy of the pen. I'm not going to embarrass anybody with trying, trying to pronounce the second word, even though I tried to look it up, should I want to try. But this nice rouge uh, should match the burgundy a little bit, so I'm excited to give it a shot. So let's go ahead and show the filling. Let me zoom back out to make sure. So I'm going to 
left turn. That opens up this snorkel, pull, pushes it out, pull back just like on the touchdown, and I'm going to see if I can hold this with a tilt. This is a full bottle, so I don't have to stick it in very far, so I think we can just see it filling via the snorkel. Okay, just the snorkel. I think I see a couple little bubbles. I definitely heard the hiss of air. Leave it for a few seconds. And there we go, we should have a full. And let's just, let's just double check it, because I was a bit shaky. Oh, I've already got a few drops falling out as I pulled it back. Yeah, size 15 sack, but it seems to hold a decent amount of ink. Let's do it one more time, knowing that it worked. Got some good bubbles. Lock it down, pull back, snorkel, and there we go. And the whole idea, I'm gonna run my finger around that section just onto the nib, clean as can be. So, true to form, it fills very cleanly. So let's see, let's get the pad over here. I'll just talk about it and I'll write down some facts and figures as I, as I learn them. So I used a couple websites, I used Richard Binder, and vacuumania.com has a, a page on several types of chafers. And so what I was learning are these came out about, let's see, 1952 and they lasted primarily until about 1959. So these, you know, they followed the touchdown models and they're the next step up, I suppose you could say. And they came at a time when everybody in the market was trying to um, reclaim market share from the up-and-coming ballpoint pen because with a ballpoint pen you didn't have the mess of ink um, you didn't have to worry about having a blotter and things to make sure you could wipe the nib off after you you fill your pens so a little bit of cleaner technology and a couple of the big brands you know they came out with their own um, idea to get around that and make it a little more keep the fountain pens a little more desirable still. And so people like Parker had the capillary filling systems, Schaefer came out with its snorkel. Um, there are probably a few others, I'm just not thinking of them right now. But the idea of the snorkel actually came from um, World War II, the German submarines. Apparently there was something called a sh snorkel, maybe that's how you say it. But the idea was that if you are underwater, Say we have this nice little submarine with its periscope. Rather than come up above the surface and let people know where they are, they had this little device called a snorkel, which could be brought up above the level of the water and allow air, fresh air, to enter the submarine. So that was the concept of the snorkel. Um, just pulling in liquid rather than air this time. So. That was it. So that was their thing, you know, and they were still competing with the Parker 51 and ballpoint pens. So the touchdown line was very successful. Um, and so they basically kept the, the same idea. They kept the overall same design, same knob. They just had to stretch out the body a little bit to make room for the filling mechanism. So easy peasy, easy investment. Although they had to come up with this filling mechanism, which over time has lovingly been called, let me see if I, what it says, the most mechanically complex pen ever made, because you had to do all that engineering just to push out a little bit of a snorkel. So I think it's a term of endearment, but it's a mechanism that's, you know, overall fairly simple, a lot of parts, but the concept is nice and it works. You know, we can refurbish it, these, it the mechanism, pretty straightforward. So I, I like it. And, the idea and the marketing behind this is they had all kinds of uh, fun colors. I mean, they had the basic ones, black, green, burgundy, um, some blues, but they also had ranges of pastels that made them very attractive, like more than just a few basic colors that things like the Parker 51s and other things were doing at the time. So it made them a lot more collectible, a lot more interesting to like many types of people. Couple that with the different types of caps you have, yet it became, tons of varieties, right? You could have a plastic cap, 
with with whatever color you want. Um, you could have metal caps, different trims, different nibs, be them palladium silver, gold, one tone, two tone, conical. So lots of mixing and matching, very personalizable. So that made it fun for people to collect or to get one for themselves. Um, and so, like I said, this is a 1952-1959 kind of model, and I'm looking at Vacuum Mania, and they have an excellent way to kind of determine what model you have. You know, you know, take a look and to see if it has a white dot or not, um, if it's a metal cap or not, um, what the trim was, what kind of nib you have, and what I came up with is that this particular model is a Sentinel. It's one of the higher tier models. I think at the time it retailed for about $22. And anything else? I do want to say that maybe the first year, the 1952 models, um, might be a little easier to, to date because you'll know right away. Because when you look at the breather tube, apparently the snorkels for the first year were made of gold. So if you see that, you automatically know you got a 1952 pen. And when I tried to date when mine was in this range, um, looking at the color primarily, but then secondarily at the sack protector, based on the color, right around 1956, they went from a lighter burgundy to a, oops, I wrote two, to a darker burgundy. Now, I'm, I, I'm not the greatest at picking out different shades of things, but to me, this looks pretty dark, uh, especially when I compare it to what I saw online. So I'm gonna take a guess and say that this is a darker burgundy, so I'm at least 1956. The other thing, the uh, sack protector, if you remember, it had, if we look at it on end, we had these nice four squared little crimpy things that slid into the section to kind of keep us on track. And so, there were no extra crimps in between. It was all just these nice, evenly spaced, um, squared off crimps. And then the rest of it was just kind of rolled over to keep the um, snorkel assembly in place. So that puts me, I think, at about a second gen pen, which probably coincides with about 1956. So I'm just gonna say this is a 1956 pen, put it right in the middle of everything. And Anything else that I care to say about it? Those are the highlights, and I think both the Richard Binder and the Vacuumania, excellent resources, a good way to start and just appreciate the history of this pen. So if I actually go down and let's say, let's do a little bit of a writing sample, I'll give my critique about it. Um, it's actually pretty comfortable. I like the length of this. Do I have my, I do. I have my ruler handy, so let's just lay it down just for a second, because I'm a five foot nine guy, and when I hold this, it comes nicely into the crook of my thumb. So uncapped, this thing comes just shy. I, I, I would go ahead and round this at five inches. It's just shy of five inches. So that's a pretty good sized pen, and it comes right into the crook of my thumb. I don't have to knuckle up on it. It's not super back heavy. It's just perfectly made to sit in my average hand, I think. So I think for a lot of people, it's gonna be a good choice. If you're on the bigger size, does it post? Yes, it does, and quite securely. And being a stainless steel cap, I do feel the weight. It does become ever so slightly back heavy, but this is not bad. There's very minimal change to me. And so I could see this being posted or unposted either way, um, depending on your preference, but definitely not one that needs to be posted. Um, the section is the spiral section. It's got these nice little groove and spiral on it. So as you notice, it does taper all the way down. So it doesn't have a nice flare to this section. So if it were smooth, made of just plain plastic or anything, you might imagine yourself sliding down or sliding back up if you were sweaty hands or had been riding for a while. But I'm actually finding that these small grooves are not bad. Like I could see myself holding this for a while if my fingers right up to the spiral of the, the, the cap, where the cap would close onto. They're very shallow, they're not sharp, they do catch the cap well, um, but if I were to slide up on these, I wouldn't mind. 
and if I were to go down a little bit, I'm not really into too much of the nib, so I could still keep a clean finger. So I think it's well made to keep me right in the middle of that section. So I think this is a good design and it makes it look very sleek and I'm very impressed with the aesthetics of the pen. The nib, and I should say, just as a reminder, um, this did have that M5 imprint on it. Now the M means medium, so there's gonna be a medium nib or what Schaefer would call a medium nib. And there were other letters that would be B for broad, F for fine, FX for flexible. Um, I think it was Z or, I think it was Z, was that one a uh, music nib possibly, but they had a whole variety of nomenclature. And then the number corresponded to their numbering system of the nibs. And when I looked up stuff, I accidentally wrote down M2 instead of M5, which this one says, and an M2 meant a medium 14 karat gold number five nib on the Schaefer scale. So I apologize for not having the number what the number five means, but it probably also means something about 14 karat, um, whatever number, maybe it indicates something about being a triumph nib or not. But uh, I think Vacuumania or the Richard Bender gives us easy answers, so be sure to look it up if you have one. If I were to talk about this writing, let's go ahead and write this, the famous sentence. The quick, Easy dog. Pretty smooth. I like it. It's, I feel the paper. Let's see if I can zoom out. I don't think that all got caught in there. So I do feel the paper. It's not scratchy. It's not really feedbacky, but it's just like, you know, I, I know I'm on the paper and it feels good. It just has this nice tactility to it, right? Um, if I were to do something like fast writing, let's see. I'm not actually writing, but up. I like it. Um, I'm not sure. I've never used this ink before. I don't know. It may be a, kind of on the drier side ink because it doesn't look as vibrant or as laid down as I thought it would be. But let's see. Let's go ahead and give it a scribble. Yeah, it's a little bit of a drier ink. So this lays down. It's not a super wet writer. Let me get some paper off of this. So Maybe a different ink would be a little bit more vibrant, a little more wet, but this one's decent. It's It's got enough flow that I can write fairly quickly. Um, it's a Triumph nib, so I'm not anticipating any real flexibility, and sure enough, I don't get any, And which is fine. This is just a good solid writer. Um, let's do random. Let's, uh, any reverse writing? Yeah, it does reverse writing as well. And that's actually not terrible. That is not super scratchy. I could see myself doing this. Yeah, you hear it, but it's actually not bad. It's actually not, yeah. Then we'll flip it back over. Picks right back up. So, so far so good. I like it. I mean, I didn't have to tune this. I think the alignment was pretty good as I looked at it under the loop. Um, so right out the gate, this has nice writing. So overall, I like it. I think it's very attractive. I think it's comfortable to hold. It's a good size overall. Um, and the nib, classic Triumph nib. So I would recommend this. This would be a good investment in being, you know, fairly ubiquitous. They made a lot of these. This would be something you could probably pick up um, on eBay and maybe a little bit of a used condition, something you have to restore, but you know, now you know how to, so I think it'd be a good investment, and this thing would be an excellent everyday writer, I think. And so, let me see, before we head out, I will go ahead and do my next tease, and I think we're gonna stick with Schaefer for the moment, and we're gonna go back to the balance line, because I wanna introduce maybe a vac filler. This is one of the nice striped celluloids um, with this, I think it's silver. I think these 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 are silver, but this nice wide cap band, Triumph nib, and back fill. And it's this is loose as can be. So it needs some new packing. It's going to need everything on the inside. But I think this would be a good one to get into. 
um, and I'll be able to happily finally show you the patience and time and struggle that you may have to have when removing these Triumph nibs. So that'll be next time. And before we go, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my paper so you can see the writing a little bit better. Let's see if I can adjust things. I'm do my zoom. Just to kind of show you guys a little bit. Yeah. So there's our snorkel. And for next time, we'll do this balance with a backfill. All right, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe, like, leave comments, let me know if you have variations in what you do, things you liked or didn't like or worried about. Um, yeah, give me everything. So I'll hope to see you next time. Thanks for keeping tuned in.